get into it today, Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, let's begin in verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary uh, principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or maturity, and not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of the doctrine of d- baptisms. We talked about that last week, baptisms, plural. We talked about the three baptisms of the New Testament. And and then laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Well, today we're going to continue talking about the laying on of hands. You know, so many people don't even understand these basic elementary, the Bible says, principles of their faith and the church. And these are foundational principles, meaning that they carry a lot of weight. And if there's something in this list you don't understand, then you're missing part of the strength God has for you to stand on. And here we find the laying on of hands. People say, well, how is that a foundational principle? You're going to find out today. So, you know, growing up, I never saw people really laying hands on people. Uh, I didn't really, I never was taught about that. And we're going to find out here it is a foundational principle, yet I didn't know much about it. Maybe you're like that as well. So let's take a look at it in the Bible. Uh, Laying on of hands is an impartation. It is uh, an impartation of authority, anointing, grace uh, towards an assignment. It provides the spiritual gifting someone needs to carry out an assignment. Or it confirms uh, someone's position uh, in the body of Christ. I like to say it this way. It's grace for the race. And whatever race you're in, whatever God's called you to do, there is grace for that race. Let's take a look at the book of Acts. Let's get an example of this. Uh, This is in Antioch. They are praying and talking together. They're going to send Barnabas and Saul, who is Paul. And uh, the Holy Spirit says, set apart from me Barnabas and Paul for the work which I have called them to. So first off, there's always grace for every assignment. Understand that. But notice how they respond, the, the, uh, the elders there, the, the, the pastors, their leaders. So after they had prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them on their way. Why would they do that? Because there's an impartation for the work of the assignment that God has given them to do. The laying on of hands carries with it an anointing and a grace to impart to someone else for Again, an assignment or as a confirmation of a position that they're in uh, or a commission of a new position. So understand this, that we do not pick our positions. In other words, I can't just say, you know, I want to be whatever position in the body of Christ. Uh, Would you lay your hands on me? Because Jesus is the head of the church. He is the one through the Holy Spirit is going to direct the positioning, the calling of people in the body of Christ And those that confirm that and also agree with that will lay hands on them and confirm that direction. Amen. Now, you can't really choose, I said. So people say, well, you know, Pastor Gary, how did you get here? Well, I did not choose to be a pastor. I did not choose, we did not choose to launch this church. Because I can remember the exact day, minute, hour that Jesus gave me an open vision. An open vision is a vision that looks like you're in it. It's not like a, you're at a distance. You're actually in an open vision. You actually are stepping into it. And I remember the day that happened for me where Jesus gave me that open vision where I was holding a Bible and I heard the voice of the Lord say, I'm calling you to preach my word three times. And I saw the room, very detailed. I saw the folding chairs, saw the people. I noticed the windows were dark. It was night. And I saw the entire room. I knew exactly what it was. I knew that I was called to preach the word of God because Jesus called me and I knew the exact moment that I was called. Now, he didn't give me direction to the office or the position that I would be in because he was leading me and preparing me, but that was enough to get me started on the road. God always leads through visions, glimpses, until you get to the place you can receive the direct assignment but he'll lead you uh, through glimpses and visions and assignments and submission to leaders as you're preparing for what he's gonna have for you in the future. Now, when I was um, called, uh, my pastor, we had our pastor, David E. Mai in Sand Springs, Oklahoma. We called him and told him what was going on. 
And he came out, he decided to come out, and he was going to, we have an ordination service. He laid his hands on Drenda and I and set us in the place of a pastor because although God didn't call me in that vision to be a pastor, later on in a church service, I can remember the exact night he called me and said, okay, now I want you to launch a church in New Albany, Ohio, teach them the kingdom as I've taught you, and I want you to pastor that church. So our pastor came out, he laid his hands on Drenda and I, he prophesied over us and set us in that place. Also, there were people there that were at that season uh, following us, around us, and it's important that they see that as well because laying on of hands can also confirm to those around you authority that, okay, this is, you know, Gary is now a pastor or whatever position, whoever you're talking about, it confirms to those people that God has, uh, is in this and that God agrees that this is right and the authority that this position is set in. And let's take a look in the Bible of uh, Pastor Timothy as an example. Uh, Pastor Timothy, we have First and Second Timothy. Timothy is a pastor of Ephesus, the largest church in Asia. Uh, they say 100,000 people. And he was very young when he began working with Paul at age 16. Uh, he was born again. At 21, he began to follow Paul on his missionary journeys. And then at around age 35, he was set in place as the pastor of this huge church. Now, when he was set in place, we need to know what's going on because Nero, the emperor, was blaming the Christians for the, Rome, the fire in Rome that destroyed most of the city. And so there was great persecution breaking out against the Christians. In fact, Nero was killing thousands of them, specifically in Rome proper, but it began to spread out across the Roman Empire as well. Now, Paul writes a letter, his first letter to Timothy, in this season, if you will, and let's look at what he says in the 11th verse. Timothy, command and teach these things. Now, he gave some direction before this scripture. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching. Do not neglect the gift of which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So when did that happen? Obviously, that is when the elders set their hands on him and set him in place as the pastor of that church. Notice with prophecy. In other words, there was an encouraging word. And I always say, you fight with that. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, remember, you know, Remember the prophetic word that you received when you were placed in this office. And remember the hands laid on you, Timothy. Let's, let's, be, let's not neglect the gift. In other words, Timothy, get your eyes off of the persecution. Get your eyes off of the fear. Get your eyes back on what did God say to you about what you're doing. And remember, Timothy, it's not about you. It's about the 100,000 people that are listening to you, and they're afraid also. You need to be my voice to them right now. Let's remember that it's not you. You have grace to do this. You speak what I tell you to speak. Remember the prophetic word. So laying on of hands is an impartation of grace, God's empowerment for you to be successful in the assignment. And by the way, you don't have to be in the ministry to have that grace. Every assignment, if you're a mom, there's grace to be a mom. If you're a husband, you're, there's grace to be a husband and a father. If you're working for a company, there's grace. There's a grace for every position. Now, you know, Timothy then writes a letter. I mean, Paul writes a letter two years later. Things are heating up uh, around there. And so a lot of things are happening. A lot of people are leaving the church. I mean, people are afraid. Paul writes the second letter to Timothy, and in verse number, first chapter five, he says, listen, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded it now lives in you also. For this reason, I am reminding you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God does not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but gives us power, love, and discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, 
or of me, his prisoner. Now, you know that the Roman government would be after the leaders, and obviously Timothy would be on their list, right, as pastoring of this large church. Timothy is a little nervous. Paul knows that. He's writing this letter, said, listen, Timothy, now this is speaking of when Paul laid his hands on him and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He did not receive a spirit of timidity. In fact, Romans, I mean, Acts chapter one, verse eight says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witness. Timothy, we need to stir that up. We need to stir that up. I remind you, I laid my hands on you. The Holy Spirit came upon you to be my witness, the power of God, the boldness. You need to remind yourself, allow yourself to be stirred up and let yourself reflect on what God says, what the word of God says. Do not be ashamed. Do not back down. Well, again, Paul laid his hands on Timothy where he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see that model all through the New Testament as well. In fact, we see laying on of hands throughout the entire Old Testament and the New Testament. Now let's jump over to Acts chapter six. This is still in the early days of the church where we have a problem. We have uh, feeding of widows and a lot of administrative type things happening. And the apostles say, look, we, we, we need to have some help doing this we want to spend time preaching and teaching and in prayer. We need to find seven people who we think are capable and anointed to administrate this, this feeding of the, of the poor and the widows uh, here in Jerusalem and, and take care of these people. So they gather some people. They have the idea of seven people. And you're going to see here, uh, it's in Antioch, excuse me, not in Jerusalem. They uh, presented these ideas, these men, to the leaders there. And it says they did what? What's the first thing they did? They prayed, meaning that they wanted to confirm through the Holy Spirit that yes, Jesus, the head of the church, agrees with this decision. Before we lay our hand on them, we want to make sure this is the right, they're the right people, right? Right? And if you're an employer, I always say, you know, it'd be nice to make sure you make sure you have the right employees before you put them in place too. And we've all found out the hard way, you know, you had to change things after you found out they weren't quite matching the resume, right? Right? But the Holy Spirit doesn't miss. He doesn't miss the resume. He knows exactly the heart. He's not moved by the talent. He knows the heart. And of course, there is talent there, but he knows the heart. And so God is going to help them identify who is to have those positions. Then they laid their hands on them. Notice they prayed, laid their hands on them, and set them into position. Again, there's that anointing. There is the grace for their race. In the Old Testament, as an example, Moses had just found out that he uh, would not be able to cross the river into Jordan. He would not go into the promised land. And then he asked, well, who would lead them? Who's going to lead them? And God says, here in Numbers 27, 18, the Lord says, take Joshua, son of Nun, who, uh, who has the spirit of God in him, lay your hands on him, present him to Eleazar the priest before the whole community, and publicly commission him to lead the people. Transfer some of your authority to him so the whole community of Israel will obey him. Now here we have an example where laying on of hands confirms a position and it confirms it to those who need to honor the authority now placed on that person. We also see the laying on of hands as Moses lays his hand on Joshua, he's, he's taking some of his grace, the Bible says, and he's believing to release that into Joshua's life as Moses is not going to cross the river, Joshua will. So here we see again another example of laying on of hands, your grace for your race, right? So after I had the vision to preach, God uh, spoke to me. I remember praying one day. I can remember the exact moment he spoke this to me. He says, listen, I want you to go to Oral Roberts University. Now, you got to remember, I flunked out of high school, basically, at one point, I think 1.7 average or something like that. I didn't really pay attention to school. I did not like school, so I, can't, I, I had mixed feelings about that. You know, really? You want me to go to college at ORU? You know, it's like, I don't know about that. I began to talk to people. I found out that ORU had a very high scholastic requirement to get in, and I knew that I would not qualify. I mean, you know, just my grade average would not qualify. But I felt impressed of the Lord to go ahead and send my application in there, which I did. And the, uh, the person from the school, the lady called me. And I remember the first thing she said, now, Mr. Cassie, you do realize that your grade average 
and your SAT score uh, does not fit our profile, uh, doesn't qualify you to come into the school. I said, yeah, I, I realize that. But she said, you went, to, you went to your Bible school and you got straight A's, so tell me what happened in your life. So I began to tell her uh, how I was born again and how I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that I was to go to ORU. So we kind of talked a while and finally she said, well, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna give you a shot, I'll let you come on out and uh, we'll get you over here. And, and then she said this, she said, now I noticed on your application that um, you're overweight. Now, again, they wouldn't do this now. She said, no, in our, you know, but 40 years ago they did, 40 some or whatever it was. She said, um, you'll need to lose 25 pounds before you come on campus. And she said, when you come on campus, before you go to the administrative building and sign up for classes, you will go directly to the aerobic center where they will weigh you for the very first thing you do when you get here. And you'll need to be 25 pounds lighter before we will allow you to come to school. Very, very unusual, I thought. But, uh, you know, I mean, I ran my dad's pizza shop. I mean, have you ever, I mean, have you ever seen a skinny pizza maker? I don't know. You know just, I mean... But I was 50 pounds overweight by age 19. I think it was 19, 20, 21, 20, right around there. So yeah, I was overweight. But what she was doing with great wisdom, okay, I see you flunked out of school. Let's see how serious you are about this. That's really what she was saying. Let's see how serious you are about this. Let's see if you can lose those 25 pounds. If you can do that, then we know you're serious enough to go ahead and sign up for classes. So I had no idea how to lose 25 pounds, you know. I mean, all I ate is pizza and hamburgers and, you know, stuff. I didn't. Obviously, I wasn't trying to lose weight. I was 50 pounds overweight. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember, you know, cut back some eating. I began to, began to jog a little bit, you know. But anyway, uh, through that, um, I don't know, having nine, ten months or whatever it was, I, um, I got down there and uh, didn't eat anything on the way to school that driving to Oklahoma, I guarantee you that. <laughs> And I got there, and I was two pounds lighter than 25. I was 27 pounds lighter. So praise God. I, but then, see, Oral had this concept of the whole man, uh, spirit, soul, and body, that you should be healthy in every area of your life. And they had aerobics program that they required you to do to even graduate and even get your grades. So that put me on a course. I, I loved to run. I lost, I lost 50 pounds. It literally changed my life, which I'm still thankful for today. But anyway, the point I'm telling the story is I went to ORU, and in my freshman class, we had to take English. And so they asked us to write a paper, and most of you know the story. I got the paper, if you'd call it that. <laughs> I didn't know how to write papers. It came back with a big red F on the front page, and it said, is it possible that you even went to high school? <laughs> True story. Now, I understand now what the, the professor, it's a very you know, high grade average college. And he's saying, I know what he's thinking, who in the world let this guy in here? And it's like, you know, I don't think he even went to high school, right? But that's what he had said in the thing. So they put me in a tutoring class and I began to work through that. And of course I did eventually pass college, which was very hard because I had a lot to make up, but I did, I, I, I met Drenda there and a lot of things happened there. And of course, uh, to make a long story short, you know our story of getting in debt and all the things happened to us. But eventually we learned the kingdom and got out of debt and so passionate to teach people about the kingdom and Destiny Image, a publisher, reached out to me. I'm not quite, I don't remember how they heard of me at that time, but they heard my teaching. And they said, we'd like to offer you a contract to write three books. Now, I had a, I had a real passion to, t uh, to teach, a real passion to help people understand how we got free and how the kingdom works. I mean, it's, I still do. And I really did have a passion. I really did feel like a book would be good because people take it, they pass it around, and it's a permanent record. And I thought, you know, I really do need to someday, I need to write a book. Well, they called me and said, we'd, we'd like to contract you for three books. And I go, three books? Wow, I didn't know I could write one book, you know, three books. <laughs> I finally, finally agreed to write two. I finally signed the contract for two, not three. But I didn't know how to start writing a book. Now, I, did, I had written Faith Hunt, my Faith Hunt book. But in reality, Amy and Drenda massaged that thing backwards, forwards, up and down. Trust me, they, back in the day, they, they did all that work, you know. Uh, it wasn't me. I mean, I, I had the stories, but they helped me out there. 
But anyway, Leif Hetland, who is a, uh, he's been here at church, uh, traveling evangelist, very anointed, uh, was in our church this week. And he said, is there anything, Pastor Gary, you'd like me to pray about? And I said, yes. I need the grace to write. Would you pray with me about the grace to write? I don't know how to write a book. I need that. So he laid his hand on me, and I remember him praying, Father, I thank you that Gary has the grace to write. We prayed together, amen. And uh, now I, I added him up there, I think last week, I think it's 20 books now I've written. And I like to write books. Um, the last book I wrote, Open for Business, I wrote in two weeks. I just sat down and just wrote it. I like writing books. I mean, it's, it's so strange. I like writing books, and I flunked out of high school, flunked out of English, <laughs> but I like writing books. And, <laughs> and <laughs> amazingly... Amazingly, the, uh, the professor that wrote the F when Fixing the Money Thing, which was the first book Destiny Image published, came out, he got a hold of it, and he called me and he said, he, t- he emailed me and said, is it possible that this is the same Gary could see that I had in my class? <laughs> I mean, he was shocked, right? Well, God likes to shock people. Grace for the race. Now, probably the best example of laying on of hands is praying for the sick. We see that a lot in the scriptures. Let's look at Luke chapter four, verse 38. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once, began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, excuse me, uh, and laying his hands on how many? Each one, he laid his hands on each one. Jesus did and healed them. Moreover, demons came out and many people shouting, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. So they had a long, I mean, Jesus prayed all night for people and laid his hands on how many? Each one. Well, Pastor Gary, you know, it says up here that he rebuked the, uh, the fever and it left her. Correct, but Matthew uh, Matthew 8, verse 15 says this. Jesus came into Peter's house, saw Peter's mother lying there in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left. So I believe many times the Bible says Jesus speaks. We're going to find that his mode of operation was laying hands on people and speaking. But laying hands on people. I mean, he laid hands on all of those people individually all night. Mark chapter six, here we find in his hometown, they did not receive him. And it says he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on only a few people and heal them. Now, of course, we do have examples where Jesus spoke, like with the centurion and healing took place. But his mode of operation most of the time was laying hands on people. There's that impartation of the anointing, right? You carry that. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in the Spirit. You are carrying the kingdom of God with you. When you lay hands on people, there's an impartation. And so it, uh, in Tulsa, the river there, Arkansas River comes through there. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, bicycle trail, running trail along the river for about five or six miles. When I was a student at ORU, I used to love to run outside and run that trail. And one day, now, you know, Oral did teach on healing. He was known for that. His ministry was healing, and he did have some great teaching on healing. But I was running down the the trail, jogging down the trail, and I saw this woman laying there up ahead of me and another woman kind of leaning over her, talking to her. So I I ran up there, and I could see she's having a really hard time breathing, and I said, what's wrong? And her friend said, well, she has asthma. She's had an asthma attack, and it was serious. I mean, she was having trouble breathing at all, And so I knelt down, laid my hands on her. I didn't ask anyone, just laid my hands on her and I rebuked that asthma and thanked the Father that he healed her. Now, she began to breathe easier and began to breathe normally and then she stood up and her friend kind of walked with her for a little bit. I I took off and, you know, finished my run. But a year later, I was running the same trail and I hear this woman, you know, hey, you know, yelling at me and I turn around and here comes this woman who I'd prayed for, she has tears coming down her face. She comes up and says, 
I just had to stop. I saw you. I had to stop. You don't remember me maybe, but you, were, you prayed for me. I was having an asthma attack, and you laid your hands on me. You prayed for me, and I wanted to tell you it's been a year. I have not had an asthma attack or anything with asthma at all for this entire year, and I, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Now, in contrary to that, I mean, a, kind of a different story. What's the word? Not Contrast. Thank you, Dren. I still have English. I'm working on it still. <laughs> Contrast to that story, uh, our babysitter, when the kids were small, her sister, her ba- our babysitter's sister, had an asthma attack, and we found out that she was in the hospital. So we went to see her. As we walked in the hospital, her parents, their, the people were there, and uh, her parents said, well, she's not going to make it. We're going to pull the plug on the machine. And uh, I thought, well, that's, I'm, you know, I'm going to pray for her. And so I turned to, she's there, we were there in ICU. We turned to go in there. I'll never forget, it still it struck me so strange. The father said, don't touch her. And I thought, that, that just, they're a very religious family. I mean, it's weird. Don't touch her? It's not like a demon speaking, right? I mean, don't touch her. It just, just. Just, it's just strange. And then, you know, they unplugged her and she was 16 years old. She went to heaven, but, you know, I mean, they, they didn't allow us to lay our hands on her or pray over her. So she went on. Matthew 9, 29, then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight. Of course, a famous story, Luke 8, 42, the woman with the issue of blood, a crowd is almost crushing them. This woman's there, and uh, she came up behind Jesus and touched his garment, and Jesus said, who touched me, I felt power flow out of me. Now, she said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be healed. But notice, she knew she had to touch him, and the power of God set her free. How many people, friend, are waiting for a touch from God? How many people out there are waiting for God to show up? Now, God, Jesus isn't going to show up. You're the body of Christ. You're going to show up. And how many out there are waiting for you to lay their, someone to lay hands on them for the power of God to come into their life with answers, deliverance, and healing? How many people out there? A lot of people, right? In fact, Jesus gave us that commission, Mark 16. He said this, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They'll drive out demons. They'll They'll um, speak in new tongues. They'll pick up snakes with their hands. When they drink deadly poison, it'll not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. That's the church. That's you. You have a commission to lay hands on people and release the power of God and bring deliverance and healing to your generation. That is your assignment. Laying on of hands is a basic principle of the New Testament church as well as the Old Testament. Notice he did not say, go and pray for the sick. He said, go and lay hands on the sick. Well, Pastor Gary, aunt so-and-so is sick. We need to pray for her. No, you need to go lay your hands on aunt so-and-so. Well, my friend is sick. We need to pray. Well, you can pray, but someone's got to go and lay hands on that person. Someone needs to go lay their hand on that person in faith and believe what God says. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. The church has kind of missed this. And that's why we want to teach this today. So uh, some of you have heard this story. We were in Hawaii uh, many years ago. And how many have seen the kite surfing out there? Where they have the, uh, the kite and it's a strong wind and the waves, they'll, they'll, they'll fly off that wave and coast for a while. You seen that? Yeah. Called kite surfing. There's a couple beaches out there in Maui that are really known for that. And so we went out there to watch that. And it was a beautiful day when these guys were, I mean, they were sailing. It's just, it was crazy. But we're sitting there at the parking lot, just full of people. And all of a sudden we heard this blood curdling scream. This woman is hysterical. And I hear her saying something about her baby. And I noticed that she's pretty close to our car. So I turn around and she's like two cars behind us. And she's hysterical, just screaming. And I look, and she has her baby in her arms. And what happened was she went down to watch the kite surfing and locked her baby, which was only maybe, how old, maybe three months or something, maybe 
four months, uh, locked her in the car in the hot sun and went down there and she came back and the baby was limp and lifeless and now the baby's not responding and she's, she's screaming, she's hysterical. So I jump out and I walk over to her and of course she's, I mean, he, she's hysterical. She's like, you know. I said, do you mind if I pray for your baby? And of course she didn't mind, she, you know, any, any help, right? And so I laid my hands on her and I, I said, in the name of Jesus, life, life, and uh, Father, I thank you for life in the name of Jesus. And I mean, the second I laid my hands on that baby, bam, that baby woke up. And she was, I mean, you cannot tell how grateful she was. She was so grateful. She took the necklace off her neck and gave it to Pastor Drenda. She was so grateful that, I mean, think, think about that. Can you imagine the relief? The, the, can you imagine that from her perspective? That was incredible. But you know what? How many people out there are waiting for you? They may not be crying hysterically, but they're dying on the inside. There's whatever, their family's torn apart. There's problems. And they're waiting for God to show up. And he's not showing up because you are God's ambassador. You carry the anointing of the kingdom and the directive of the kingdom, the commission of the kingdom. You carry that power, that grace with you. And you can lay your hands and bring deliverance, healing, and relief to people's lives. Now, of course, we pray with people, but we join hands, we lay hands on the sick. Amen? Amen. And so I want, to, I want to ask these questions. Will you give God your hands? Will you allow God to use your hands? You're the body of Christ. Will you allow God in this generation, in your life, will you, will you be open to that? You know, will you be open to someone that's in trouble? You don't have to maybe know them, but you'll be open to the spirit of God. Will you be open to use your hands? That's why this is a foundation doctrine of the church. God wants to touch people. He needs you to do it.